Okay, welcome everyone to the third event of our Business Architecture Meets Sustainability webinar series. How can organizations leverage business architecture to enhance and accelerate their sustainability efforts? That's basically what the whole series um, is about and what we started to explore in our sessions last year. Well, the first session in this series kind of provided a general introduction into business architecture and sustainability coming together in an effective way. We learned that sustainability is more than bees, plants, and trees, and that it needs more than just, well, nice sustainability statements on our corporate websites and establishing sustainability managers in our organizations. Among other things, it needs, well, adequate methods and tools to help deal with sustainability in a really comprehensive way. And this is where business architecture comes into play as an increasingly relevant practice in organizations nowadays. Business architecture can help make sustainability measurable, actionable, and visible. This is because it provides a holistic view of the organization and the ecosystem in which it operates, which helps translate strategy into execution in a cohesive way, well, unified across the different business units and products an organization might have. In the second session, we focused on sustainability reporting on how sustainability reporting efforts can benefit from the use of business architecture. Among other things, we concluded that business architecture provides a common business context for metrics we may want to establish and use to measure progress in our organizations. That it accelerates and ensures the, uh, the completeness of data collection and that it helps identify opportunities for improvements. Today, and well, and I've been looking forward to this session for quite a few weeks, uh, we are going to focus on the circular economy. How can organizations leverage business architecture to help achieve circularity and contribute to the transition to a circular economy? So let me quickly introduce who's on this session today. My name is Daniel. I'm the founder and managing director of Across in the Head, and I'm hosting today's event. Then we've got our, well, by now I will have to say regular cast of panelists, uh, Wendy Keen and Daniel Obst. Wendy is a thought leader and community builder in the business architecture and strategy execution space. Uh, she's a co-founder of a not-for-profit business architecture association and author of a really great book uh, titled Strategy to Reality. Daniel is our expert on sustainability. He supports organizations, well, on their journey um, of making the businesses more um, sustainable. He's also um, a LinkedIn top voice on sustainability and a sought after speaker on topics related to sustainability. Well, and I'm thrilled that we have a third panelist on board today, which is Catherine Bart. Catherine is head of circular economy at Natural State. She's a sought after speaker with a large network and one of the initiators and co-founders of the Nordic Circular Hotspot. Catherine has a background in system design, technology and the media industry and can boast an executive master of management from Oslo Business School with deep dive in green economics. In 2022, she was listed in the top 50 global women in sustainability in Sustainability X magazine. Catherine, thanks for being with us. It's really an honor for us to have the chance to have this conversation on circular economy with you today. Well, having introduced this fantastic lineup, let's shed light on business architecture and circular economy now. So what do these topics have to do with one another? How do things kind of come together um, effectively? So let's first aim to set kind of a common ground for the discussion that we're going to have later in this session. Having a look at the circular economy side first. So Daniel and Catherine, um, could you please take us through a few introductory thoughts on, well, what's the essence of a circular economy? 
and why the transition to a circular economy is so important. What's the current set of practice? How far have organizations come in making their businesses more circular? And maybe also what are major challenges for organizations that might need to be overcome to shift from a linear model of business to um, a closed loop system, right? Daniel, would you like to start? Yeah, thanks, uh, Daniel. I uh, want to give a brief uh, overview on yeah what is sustainability about and what uh, how, how does circular economy link to it. So let me share um, a few slides for that, and I hope you can see my screen now. Um, so uh, if we talk about sustainability, let's first uh, yeah look at what's what is it about, and I want to share uh, our view on yeah kind of the the global framework we have on sustainability, uh, the global kind of standard that are the 17 SDGs uh, invented in 2015 uh, from the United Nations, nearly all uh, countries in the world uh, accepted on these uh, goals uh, that we want to reach until 2030. And they cover basically everything we can think about in, uh, in the topic of sustainability whether it's the social parts uh, in the top corner here with no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, or it's the uh, uh, ecological parts or like climate action, uh, biodiversity, et cetera. And it, it's good that we are talking about these topics and that we frame uh, sustainability this way because uh, there are quite a few challenges we have in our world. And uh, if, if you are uh, kind of in the bubble of sustainability, then you will know that, but uh, some others may not. Uh, and I want to just uh, zoom in a little bit on uh, the uh, planetary boundaries. You might have heard of the planetary boundaries as uh, uh, yeah, a, a science-based model where we can see uh, whether uh, certain uh, boundaries of our planet are in the green area or not anymore. And you can see here that many of these uh, boundaries are not in the green area anymore, so not, uh, not, not good anymore. Um, so we, we stretch those boundaries uh, even to really a bad state today already. And if you look at climate change, we are talking about a lot, and that's for good reason, but that's not the worst part here. Yeah. So if we look at biodiversity loss, for example, that's here, uh, we are even worse today than we are under climate change already. So um, we need to change the way we are yeah, we are consuming, we are producing, et cetera. Yeah? And that uh, you, you can read that from this model. Yeah? And that's important to understand. So what are the big solutions to change the, this way of, uh, yeah, of how we run our economy? Um, and uh, in the end, you can say, okay, there are probably hundreds or thousands or even more solutions that we need for sustainability. So there's not this one solution and we do this and then we're done. Yeah, and that's unfortunately not the case. Um, and that is uh, the complexity of this topic. Um, so uh, we are not going through these hundreds and thousands of solutions, but there are some key solutions that we want to look at. Um, and uh, they are, for example, uh, the energy transition. So we need to get away from fossil fuels uh, and all these fossil stuff and we do need to uh, get to the uh, yeah renewables okay that's uh, common knowledge already we are not there yet so there's still a long way to go but that's uh, not uh, yeah not new and we also need a, a, a transformation let's say in the transport sector and the mobility sector how we come from a to b yeah how, how do we travel um, okay, that's uh, good to understand as well. And we we probably also need a diet transition. What do we eat and how do we produce what we eat? Okay, so these are uh, the major solutions uh, in the sector of sustainability. But there's also a fifth one I want to name here, and there are more, of course. Um, but the fifth one is circular economy. So what is circular economy about? Let's take a look. And I have uh, from the Cradle to Cradle NGO uh, two, uh, two uh, figures here. 
one is the biological cycle and we are pretty uh, yeah aware of that biological cycle because that's how the how the, the earth runs how, how our planet runs yeah we have plants uh, that come from biological nutrient you could say uh, we produce something from the plants we uh, we uh, crop and then we have a product we use it and we should come to biodegradation and then back to biological nutrient and then back to plants and etc. So we have a circular economy here and that's how uh, nature <laughs> runs and we should adapt that. Yeah? Um, and uh, the uh, the headline here says cradle to cradle because it's this understanding. Today we usually, our economy usually runs from cradle to grave. Yeah. So at the end of a product of its life cycle, yeah, as we call it, its end of life. Yeah, that's it best case we can recycle parts of it but that's not circular economy so circular economy if you look at the technical cycle on the other hand is the very same thing so we have technical nutrient we produce something we have a product we use it and at the end we when it reaches its end of life we dismantle it and get it back to technical nutrient so we don't require new resources from the earth every now and then when we produce a new product that's where we need to come at the end and that is i want to stop there with my brief introduction because now it's the right moment to hand over to Catherine, since she's the expert on what i just uh, yeah gave an introduction to so Catherine. thank you very much it's an honor to be here among you and i'm very excited about this time together i'll just uh, share how can i now share my screen with you. Um, one participant can share the time. Here we go. And now just going to... show my full screen for you. Second. Sorry, I think I would just have to do. Uh, here we go. I will. Now I'm ready. Even if we practice, it's like every time. <laughs> Ah, uh, here we go. Do it again. So um, it was quite a thrill uh, to meet your community a couple of months ago to see how I the years that I've been working to dive into the chaotic and complex haven of circular economy when you actually want to challenge a two or three hundred year old economic system and do it with confidence and belief and actually believe that we can make earth positivity become the winner when we have done our stuff. So my name is Catherine Barth. I am head of circular economy natural state. It's a small uh, strategy agency working for market and place development on circular and sustainable principles. We have our office in Oslo, but we work pretty globally and having circular principle at the core uh, for sure. Let's see. Mm. Uh, today, uh, some thoughts. Uh, I will present very much uh, some of the maybe outcomes that we see recognizable uh, circular business models as, as we see them in the market. But I also want to link the key thoughts that you presented, Daniel. How do we understand cradle to cradle to the biological cycles and the technical cycles? And especially uh, exciting it is to talk with the business architecture uh, community. How does this apply to technological principles? And how do you actually use strategies uh, to implement circular economy, especially since a lot of the value creation in circular economy happens between enterprises and businesses and not only within. Times are changing.
changing and I think the time is working for us. And one of the uh, projects that I, we have been working on, we work with place development, we work out in the regions, we work with the national gap reports, very metric driven, but also we have been among the initiators for the Nordic Circular Hotspot. We didn't invent this ourselves, but we are keen learners and we learned this from Holland Circular Hotspot, which is uh, it's initiated by the Dutch government to make a massive collaboration engine to make the market scientists, consumers and researcher collaborate together because it's only massive collaboration that can make this transition work across silos, sectors and borders. I'm just like, uh, this is a regional driven map. So the Nordic community is pretty huge. Uh, it's the 12th largest economy in the world. So if we actually put our heads and hands together, we think that we might also drive a transition to economy from a very, very consumer driven part of the world, but also understanding that we're part of the linear problem, uh, but also uh, owning and also extracting lots of linear resources from our natural resources. <clears throat> And just keen reminder that circular economy is nothing, it's not rocket science. We all came from circular economy. It's nothing new. We basically a couple of hundred years ago, we knew how to take care of our resources. This is a classical uh, building uh, uh, from the Norwegian uh, countryside. You could keep the resources and uh, logs in use for centuries and centuries because people knew or the local economies knew how to evaluate the materials that were in use. These you could take apart, they're modular, you could move it across the fjord and put it up, up uh, elsewhere. And this is basically maybe the circular principle as we see it today. This is the mother model that you shared with us, Daniel. This is the Mel MacArthur butterfly model uh, that was uh, created. And you will recognize on the left side, it's the biological cycle. It's the green one. It has its nature principle, how the circular green economy is driven. And on the right hand side, you have the blue technical cycles and the technical materials. And they all need uh, today, there are most of the materials are lost in the waste bin and huge waste mountains, but this is the same kind of principle. And I adore quoting the mother of this uh, model, Ellen MacArthur. She was the first female uh, uh, ocean uh, sailor. And while she was sailing across our beautiful earth, she came to think and understand that the system is broken. There is no way we can fix a broken system. Our oceans and our atmosphere is filling up with pollution and waste, and we just have to redesign the system. And then she uh, went ashore and she founded Ellen MacArthur's Foundation, which has been a form very, very important, impactful uh, system change organization with these three significant design models. It is how can we design every product and every system to eliminate waste and pollution? And it starts in the design phase whenever we start to plan for new shoes or new cars or new tables. And then we can see design any product to keep their materials at highest value at any times. And when uh, material is lost out of its value chain, it is only there to regenerate nature. Of course, this is contradictory to how we are now living in a linear lock and in a linear system. So understanding that where we are standing in the, in the history of time, we are in the middle of a quite significant paradigm shift. This is not for anyone to solve alone. And luckily, we are supported by huge uh, political drivers now. And what we see on the European, among the European uh, uh, EU states, uh, it's top driven that we see there has never been so many regulatory frameworks hitting the market now. And confusion will be pretty normal and even a better reason to stick together and be ahead of the regulatory that will come that will prevent waste to happen within a couple of years. So when Franz Timmermans actually is declaring that there is zero chance to reach our climate goals without applying circular economy, and he also states it is the circular economy, which is the model of the future future. And he's very well supported by Ursula von der Leyen, who she's also promising deep and systemic transformation to apply new economic, the new economy. And it is how we apply raw materials that will power our future economics. So what we see is a mindset shift and we have to understand that the way we have been taught and learned uh, in a linear system, it is uh, also a transition and I hope that might be part of the dialogue later on today. In the linear economy, we are very concerned about value chains. We accept that 
uh, all materials are finite. They will die one day. They don't apply to the cradle to cradle. They go to cradle to death. And this is very normal in a linear economy. We tend to think in lean systems where we want to reduce waste, but we want to reduce our harness. We are uh, problems. Uh, we are nurturing monocultures and we are very deducted on ownership. It's my property. It's my uh, car. It's my house. And uh, we also see it's very product oriented and we will see that also in enterprise and, and, and business architecture as well. In a circle mindset, we actually tend to change the language where we walk into the world of value systems systems and value flows. We need to accept that, or we design for infinity, we design for eternity, and we think that when one material is lost, it is well, usable for someone else after my time. Design thinking is quite as a powerful uh, emerging uh, tool to think. It's not only about reducing waste, but how can we create more value with lesser resources? And this is also a systemic approach with systems design. How can we extract more value from more people? And this is, I would say, quite an emerging thinking and where we value usage and we value function. So I put on the icons of a black tunnel, which is maybe the icon for the linear economy on its uh, uh, track for the waste mountain and also see how can we uh, apply innovation system thinking. And this is pretty a uh, basic uh, overview of how the circle business models look like. And I think that will be the core topic, how I will have one point where I share some uh, samples of the circular business models, uh, how they uh, how they are in usage, but also how the back end and the system looks like behind. So it's very much about all kinds of sustainable inputs, as Daniel mentioned. It's how we apply what comes into the value chain. It's the renewable energy, regenerative resources. How was it transported here? and where's the origin and then we apply the business models of sharing we go to product as service we see that modularity and repairability is a default and when a product reaches its end of life it's not a graveyard there but it's a new life emerging so then i this morning i was thinking how can i share a sample and this is the egg from my kitchen table breakfast table this morning and this was a discovery a couple of weeks ago when we did sustainability audit in the region in norway and then they were going to have like a, 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 a prove, uh, what do you call it, egg production farm. And then how much waste does actually an egg create? And I'm sorry to say that even one thing is natural, like I was at Earth's uh, uh, Earth uh, 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 waste and so on that you can put back to nature. But I couldn't believe what I was hearing when I understand that this hen, the mother of the egg, is actually becoming waste. She will be burned and she will become biogas because we have no system of putting this uh, piece of meat or this 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 uh, part of the food value chain out into the system and create more value. It hurts, and this is maybe how when we start to looking into our wasteful industrial value chains, we will discover very powerful places to do innovation. I know this uh, slide looks terrible, but it, I put it together because two weeks ago we were part of enabling the Global Talent Award, and this is the actually winner of the Global Talent Award, Jinali Modi. She's a former McKinsey consultant. She's a Yale student, and she comes from India, and she had discovered to produce one ton of banana, you produce uh, four tons of banana waste. And that was when she put all her team together. It's a very typical cross-functional team with design, agriculture, material science, and actually emerge a new kind of leather, fruit waste leather. And she's now into the market and she dreams to have like high luxury uh, uh, bags designed by banana waste leather and see how can we now train our minds to see how can we reduce waste and apply. But it's a very beautiful case and the leather is simply beautiful and very uh, uh, fine in tune what we need to see tomorrow. This resonates also what we discovered in uh, Rotterdam, a blue city uh, innovation lab a couple of weeks ago, where they have a separate actually fruit leather waste lab, where you see these beautiful purses from tomato stems, and they are pretty uh, all in use. And they have, you see on the right hand side, it's a showcase how they make shoes and purses and other leather products. And in the middle here, you will see these beautiful men's uh, designer shoes made on mango waste leather. And this is the kind of material revolution we will see when we are going to see how can we actually uh, make new supply chains.
I'm also showcasing Tord Sikforsson. He's an entrepreneur worth watching out for. He has redesigned the fish system on Iceland and he has really shown how actually uh, you can make uh, multiple value out of fish and make the market value uh, uh, really be rich. It's not only about reducing waste, but how they apply thinking any kind of parts from the fish or the fish ecosystem be can become a new product in a new market. So what they see when this has become a market business principle, they now can estimate that the value of cod skins is estimated to grow 700% in the next five years. And they have a lot of side streams that you will see in the beauty, beauty and medical market. And they actually predict that the value of fish skin, which now is basically some kind of waste, will reach half the value of fish exports for Iceland in five years. And for anyone who is a little bit uh, um, uh, carries a, 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 a I am on the crush for Iceland. This is worth watching and look out for this. So why is it so valuable? So when you do actually do medical research on the fantastic uh, uh, materials of fish skin, this has become a new kind of medical treatment for burning skin. But it's also this beautiful brand of Oh my cod, which sells collagen to high level uh, expensive uh, export market for women about my age uh, that uh, value uh, beauty products. So this has totally another price in the market than uh, raw fish as we know it. Here is a very cool business model. This is kids clothes as rental because we, everybody who has had a kid knows how, how fast they grow and how expensive it is. But when you actually design for high quality and make up like this park uh, play suit lasts for at least 10 families with high quality, this demands a back end with lots of repairability. It demands really high level quality products. It demands a business model that is that makes it easy for the users to actually receive a new uh, play suit and when your kid grows out of it in the spring you receive a new the next fall but you don't buy it you don't sell it this uh, the entire material flow for this uh, these textiles are kept in the system and this also offers reducing textile waste it's designed with high quality and a longevity for multiple families with a guarantee and finally, why do I love that when we attack the or attach this to technology? So when we do think of uh, 3D printing and, and additive manufacturing, we can see how can we apply local supply chains and more regional and localized manufacturing with beautiful design and making new kind of employment. So when we enter this world of system change, we also need to understand what problems to solve, because when we zoom out from the egg, from the fish or from this uh, textile product, we see that every product is part of a value chain or another kind of system. And I will dig very fast into four kinds of different kinds of system approach that I would say they can all be attached to business enterprise thinking and uh, business architect uh, thinking. So here is the biggest problem, as you were mentioning, uh, Daniel, the Virgin material extraction is reaching all time high and it goes really fast. The global consumption is growing absolutely. It, it goes really fast and it's all based on uh, primary materials. And this is destroying bio biodiversity. This is really uh, taking out resources that is limited from the earth and the material uh, consumption climbs year after year. The global economy is less than 10% circular. And I regret to say that in the Norwegian market, it's less than two and a half percent. So this is why we're concerned. How can we actually turn this? And if you look on the, down to the very thin red line in this year by year, some since the Paris SDG goals were applied that you showed us in the beginning, Daniel, till Glasgow last year, it has even reached, uh, it's even gotten worse. So we have uh, passed more than, uh, uh, the, the extraction is uh, projected to uh, uh, to increase. So this is why we all are dedicated to solve this uh, huge uh, structural prob problem. And this is how it looks like when we try to uh, look at the resource flows on the global level. Uh, on the left hand side, this is how we take out the virgin materials or primary materials. There are minerals, there are stones, it's biomass. How we take it out, how we process it, how we produce every item we need, how we transport it. And when it comes to how we buy it or purchase it or use it, it's all based on societal needs. Whether you live in Kenya or in uh, Norway or in Asia, we have some basic 
and human needs. They're connected to if we need buildings, we're part of a communication system, we're part of a mobility system, and pretty like uh, templates of how we build our society one way or the other. Consumption, food and nutrition, and these, it's how we fix our broken value chains and upstream that we might actually make a system change. This is how we performed, broke down a value chain on the fish value chain, natural state. So how do we understand uh, actually zooming down and opening the black box upstream history in a value chain, what happened with the fish before it got to my plate or before it was a medical or before it was another kind of product. And understanding the discovering Klondike it actually is to dig down into these wasteful uh, transition ports uh, uh, where uh, the linear economy has been totally wasteful. A second sample of value chain mapping is when you go to your coffee shop and you have your cup of coffee, would you know how much waste actually a coffee plant has made before you got your five minutes of coffee uh, happiness? And we are part of a coffee value chain, so we are really seeing how can we disrupt the value creation and we deduct the, the waste production from the former strong linear value chains in the bioeconomy. Now I want to zoom out because when we connect value chains to value chains, we will see more value systems. And it is when we capture value between and among enterprises, this is how can one value chain take usage of another value chain's waste. And this is maybe the most challenging part in a linear system where we love to be in silos and sectors, built environment for built environment, textile for textile, and here we go, total crossover, and it feels very uncomfortable for many. So this is how maybe an industrial symbiosis looks like, and this is in real time how we wanted to localize a variety of meat production, greenhouses, you could have carbon capture, how do you do grass production? How can we do plant recycling, but actually relocating a lot of the process management on the same place that is more resource productive in a linear economy. And that's when you also see you can make new products when you go to closing the loops, but this is also a way of reorganizing global value chain system to maybe industrial symbiosis thinking. And in an enterprise uh, architecture, this is where it really gets exciting, connecting these. Uh, another key finding, so when we, you mentioned transport, so this is a fantastic finding from the hub of Rotterdam. Through the hub of Rotterdam, one third of all products and materials in Europe are entering one spot. Well, it's a huge spot, but they also see this provides new supply chains for the port of Rotterdam, for the regional area, but also for the Dutch economy in Netherlands, but also see applying circular principles will also be uh, demands that you have the ability to keep track of materials that are in loop so they don't get lost out of the system. So this is a fine strategic document that was shared uh, with us from Rotterdam Port. And when you apply this system mindset, when you track and trace the value chains through a city, this is also how circular economy have uh, emerged uh, best practice of circular scan, where you can not only measure what goes out of a city as waste and pollution, but you can measure what goes into a city system and also measure what is in circulation. It means how can we apply long-term value and also prevent what's going out, but keep materials in use. So this is how these uh, x-rays or spaghettis look like. And when you try to go behind them, of course it's chaotic, but it's really exciting to understand that in a Sankey diagram like this, it is possible to measure, but we need to measure. And this is my bridge where my discovery uh, a, lot, a couple of months ago for the business architecture was amazing. I was so happy to meet you uh, when you shared some of the key insights from the book, uh, uh, Wendy, Strategy to Reality. And it was maybe some of the uh, alphabets or letters in the alphabet that I had been mis missing because you showed me a fantastic framework, how you think and apply business architecture. And I, this is very homemade, but when I started digging down into this, it really is the twin sister of the circle economy, or maybe it's the circle economy 3.0, I don't know, but I wanted to do some highlights. We are all concerned about stakeholders, which is on the top of your architecture. We are all need to have a traceability on the products. You have already applied a sense of understanding within the value streams, not only value chains. 
you have already applied a sense of understanding the metrics within a business architecture and also coming from systems design and service design myself we are totally in love with user journeys and ux and so on thinking that anyone who has been training for user journeys can now step to the next level how do we now design for material journeys and having the same kind of mindset into this uh, way of doing strategy for circular economy. So this is maybe my last handshake and really looking forward to being in dialogue with y'all and see if there is any connectivity, understanding that our earth comes as a limited resource and how can we apply principles that uh, connect the enterprise or design enterprises and business architecture with circular economy. Thank you. Well, many thanks, Catherine. <laughs> this was, uh, well, really insightful. Um, now it's going to be your turn, Wendy. Um, would you mind sharing a few thoughts on, well, the role that business architecture may play to help organizations um, make their businesses more circular? Indeed. And what an absolutely incredible backdrop and uh, delighted and honored to be a part of this conversation. So let me just share here one moment. And I somehow can't get it in the right mode. Is it okay mode? Hopefully it's in the right position. Yeah, okay, all right, good. Um, fantastic. So let's uh let's talk about business architecture now. Um first, uh, what is this business architecture that we're talking about? And it's really a holistic view of an organization and the ecosystem in which it operates. And Catherine, just an absolutely perfect segue there to the diagram you were sharing. So we can think about business architecture as multiple different lenses, multiple different views into an organization and what it does. You've already perfectly highlighted some of the key points, um, starting with the capabilities, right? What are the abilities an organization has to deliver its products and services and support its operations, the value streams, the information, um, the vocabulary that we use to speak with each other in a common language, and just even understanding the stakeholders, the business units, the partners that work together to do all of this. And I won't highlight all of, uh, all of the, the perspectives here, but those are a few key ones. And for the purpose of our circular economy discussion today, I've highlighted a few blueprints here. So, while business architecture is really a multi-dimensional multi set of information about what a business does, it becomes more tangible through various blueprints like business models and value networks and value chains and capabilities and value streams. So those are the ones that we're going to double click on today. And so why is business architecture so valuable, right? Why is it part of this conversation around how we can enable a circular economy? Um, again, highlighting uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation here and a little bit uh, in the same vein you were sharing, uh, Catherine, the problem and of course the solution starts with design. And that is really the why where business architecture comes in. So I'll use a bit of an analogy here. If we think about a map or a blueprint, right? Those things help us to create common understanding and activate change. And so, you know, we can ask a question like, what if we didn't have a map, a common understanding of where we live or the world map? How would we understand where we are, where we're going and how we're gonna get there? Or if I were to put an addition on my home, if I didn't have a blueprint, how would I know where the load bearing walls are? How would I know where the electricity, how would I know where the plumbing is? So business architecture at a macro level plays that function for organizations. And so in a nutshell, what it brings to this conversation is we already have a blueprint for our organizations and our ecosystems. We don't have to spend time creating it and having all those conversations. We can use it to do the important work of circular design, redesign, and shifting mindsets. And so what makes business architecture such an ideal framework for that? Because it is unique. Um, it's very holistic. So literally represents the whole scope of an organization and its business ecosystem. 
It's entirely business focused, simple language for anyone to understand. In fact, it's created by a cross-functional group of business people across silos. It reflects a high level of detail because we know there's a lot of complexity here. So it kind of gives us the, the top layer of the onion and then we can selectively go into detail as needed. And we can, of course, the business architecture becomes this sort of scaffolding. Uh, we can connect though high level viewpoints like capabilities and value streams to the details of people, process, technology, and assets. And so, Maybe there's three things. How does business architecture help organizations contribute to a circular economy? And the first is, as I'm highlighting here, it is a holistic and you'll see a value oriented framework for design and redesign. As Daniel Simon said in the beginning, it helps us to translate business strategy, direction changes into coordinated actions because we make a lot of changes, right? So we need to get those into action. And lastly, it helps us to embed the mindset into our organizations and ecosystems and our very paradigm of business and how we design them in the first place. So how do we leverage business architecture for design and redesign? And perhaps if we might want to think about a, a spectrum of moving towards circularity, I have, as an example, three focuses moving from, you know, from, from reducing down to leaning into more circularity and uh, you know bigger change. So the first level, it's just reducing. Maybe we can think about that as um, you know, removing waste from products and operations, doing it right. A deeper level where there's a lot of work to happen is in redesign. So we can think about that one maybe as doing the right things and preventing waste from happening in the first time, shifting from offering goods to services, sharing economy, uh, making a linear life cycle circular, for example, taking things back into the cycle and using renewable material and energies in the first place. And then there's also just the very rethinking, uh, reimagining the purpose, the value of an organization. And for example, how can we actually become a regenerative company? How can we actually build up natural capital? So, not uh, not the finite, not a in uh, you know the full list, but I do have some business architecture views over there to the right hand side to help give some insight that. There are certain techniques like business models and value networks that are better suited for the macro level conversation, the step back, the redesign, the rethink. Value streams, that is business architecture, value streams and capabilities are really good to frame and help us identify and help us implement in a coordinated way uh, changes around reducing and redesigning. And something like lean value streams, which is a discipline on its own, it's not part of business architecture, but a partnership, that's really good for helping us to optimize, right? Especially when we want to reduce. So we have this whole collection of, of tools, right? These and more that we can use. And I'll just share three quick examples, and then we can have a bit of conversation here. But as an example around the reducing, uh, again, leveraging the relationship between, in particular, business architecture value streams and business processes or like lean value streams, we can identify opportunities to increase efficiency and reduce waste. So here's a business architecture value stream intentionally very abstract, so we can see the forest, not the trees, uh, very value focused. And we can tie lean value streams to different stages of our business architecture value streams. And so this goes two ways. We can identify from the business architecture value stream where we need to be reducing waste um, and then drive those changes through lean value streams, right, and those techniques. Or we can look at data from those lean value streams and roll it back up, heat map, if you will, right, the different stages of the value stream so we can have a macro level idea of what's going on, how good or bad are we in certain areas, and where do we want to target investments. So that's one example. A second example, using the business model canvas here, so these are more of the redesign or the rethinking plays. On the left-hand side, if these techniques are new to you, it's a value proposition canvas. We would create one for each customer segment that we have. On the left-hand side of that canvas, we're matching our products and services with hopefully 
creating gains and reducing pains for our customers or constituents. On the right-hand side, we have a business model canvas. So very well-known, very solid techniques here describing how an organization creates, delivers, and captures value. So the customer segments and the value proposition from the left-hand side, they actually fit into the, the, um, the business model canvas on the right-hand side. And we have building value in the middle, customer-related building blocks to the right, and more of how we make that real uh, building blocks to the left, key partners, activities, resources. And so using these as a framework for conversation and innovation and communicating changes, we can ask questions such as, are there opportunities to keep products and materials in use? Or what are the opportunities here? Can we serve new customers, whether that's through new eco-friendly products that might appeal to different audiences or maybe new revenue streams, <clears throat> excuse me, as we are adding new value or maybe taking something back into repair, doing additional things to add value to those, those goods. Or <clears throat> can we shift from a good to a service? And even other opportunities to leverage our existing building blocks, our existing value streams and capabilities in new ways to deliver new value or add new value onto existing products and materials. One of my favorite examples of that, it's just a, a real sort of a simple example was, I was working with a shipping company. So they obviously have these shipping containers for people to move their goods across the ocean. And as we were doing value stream mapping, they were identifying how people don't like to give back the shipping containers, right? And how valuables these actually are. So it led to more conversations around actually using, reusing, creating new value. Now that street, that picture there is from uh, South Africa where you see these shipping, and it's in many parts of the world, but where you see people using shipping containers for uh, office buildings, or in this case, a store or even restaurants. So just cool ideas. And one last idea, and then Daniel, I'll turn it back over to you for conversation is leveraging the value network. So um, again, as Catherine was saying, it's really important now to be bringing organizations together. We can't achieve sustainability on our own, right? We, we, we do need to do this together. So a value network shows us, again, forced for the trees, what are the different entities that are in play? Um, and what's the value that they exchange? So that's usually tangible value like products and services and revenue. And that's intangible value, such as other benefits and, um, and knowledge, right? So again, with this overall backdrop, this map, we can also extend that and use these frameworks for things like industrial symbiosis as was mentioned earlier. So this is an example of an industrial ecosystem from Denmark. And again, if we have these maps, we have these blueprints uh, already created, we can add things like energy and material exchange to them. So with that, Daniel Simon, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Wendy. I think this was a brilliant overview. And I'm going to get back to what you just showed on the very last slide. Um, so we go, I'd like to kind of um, dive into this um, aspect a little further with you, uh, uh, kind of having uh, some further discussion on, on value. But before we're going to do this, maybe to, to start off the discussion. Um, so what, what do you think, Catherine and, and, and Daniel, um, in terms of what we just heard about, uh, about regarding the role that business architecture might play. Does this resonate with your way of thinking on what it might need for a business to become circular? Well, whether it pertains to um, a shift in mindset, um, the definition of certain design principles, uh, whatever it's gonna be. Any thoughts on this? Could business architecture really somehow help guide organizations on their transition to a circular economy? 
can I can uh, uh, Daniel Obst gave a little bit a hands up because he said it's not about uh, only solving a waste problem, but how can we design for circularity? And we see now a huge movement coming in that we have to solve huge waste mountains, but that is not circular economy. It's a, like a regenerative uh, economy. It's a fine uh, a staircase. It's like or a segue, as you said. But I think the huge challenge is actually to see how is this going to capture business value and how can we invest in these systems? Uh, because it is it's really a contradictionary to a linear mindset, which is protecting our data, protecting our resources. Maybe waste is a cost, but we would rather stay with a cost problem than thinking that this is going open. I don't know what the barriers are, but I love when you put up the business world canvas and also the value proposition canvas, but because that's very, very, uh, it's a real explorative uh, way to think like who could benefit of banana waste, who could, uh, and it's not about only solving banana waste, but it's also having white sheets and see how do we actually design perfectly functional business models. Because the last problem would which is real now it is investments and financing because as you say it looks pretty chaotic and we speak with banks so they are used to invest in one company they don't invest in systems for example so i think applying uh, the business architecture uh, uh, perspectives will make it safer and build more confidence among stakeholders to start innovating for circularity now Thanks, Catherine. I would like to add that, uh, like with many or maybe most uh, sustainability topics, uh, also circular economy is about systemic change. So it's not done by applying uh, a certain process, changing a certain process here and, and some responsibility and that's it. And then it's going to work somehow, <laughs> the magic will happen and we are going to be circular. It's a systemic change. And what does systemic change and a transformation require? Uh, on the one hand, it's strategy. So how do we do this right? How do we get there? What do we need on the way uh, to get there? And it requires a good, good strategy also requires the right tool set. Yeah? And what is the right tool set to such a systemic change like circular economy? Um, business architecture probably is a very good tool set to address and find and identify and then apply the right changes in the uh, yeah, all the spots that Wendy showed us. Yeah? So um, based on what you just said, would, would you then agree with me uh, when I said it, it really has much to do with, uh, well, um, and, and Wendy basically um, pointed this out with one of the slides she showed, um, rethinking and redesigning value. Yeah? Um, so it, it's that's something that's going to be at the core of shaping a circular economy and that's where then also business architecture, um, well, will play or can play a certain role um, using the techniques uh, that, that Wendy presented. Would you agree with that? Any thoughts on this? I can only agree uh, as we need, uh, as you call it, a blueprint or if to drive a car, you have to know the rules, how to behave on the road. Uh, if you ch change the road system, you have to drive differently. So this is how we are to behave in a, in a, bus in a circular business uh, innovation world. Or uh, I like the blueprint. I like the way, but we don't have to change wheels or that we have for, uh, one way to steer. There is a language. There is a business strategy language that already is applicable. And this is why I was very fond when I saw the approach and the narrative that you create. But we also have to understand it's only about people. And when people don't feel secure, if they're in law or finance or technology, we don't understand each other. They tend to be pretty, I would say, uh, pacified. So uh, uh, this is a way to activate existing business approach and uh, emerge it for a more holistic uh, systems approach, as uh, Daniel also is stressing. It, it is hard to understand that we live in a, the, the, our system is not sustainable. It, I think that's like the last mile to walk. Uh, we cannot make circularity in a linear system. People love, we will see a lot of circular washing now. We will uh, have a hard time to deduct what is uh, circular washing from really as circularity. And this is also why we have to have reliable models and blueprints that we can lean on. I can only just echo what um, what you all have shared, but just I'm, I'm inspired too by 
just the use of blueprints and what I'll echo you saying is, what are the principles of design for circularity, right? And embedding those not just today at the, the, the board tables and all, you know, governments, but also in universities. So as we learn about business and even children, of course, we don't learn anything else, right? We're just familiar with blueprints and we're familiar with how they need to be circular and designed to really embed that mindset from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel, you referred, to, so that's uh, maybe an additional aspect that I think it's worth um, uh, highlighting again. You refer to the UN Sustainable Development Goals at the very beginning. Um, of your presentation. Could you maybe share a few more insights on how this is related to the transition to a circular economy? Because, um, well, I think this is this is important in order to really understand and appreciate the role of circular economy as a um, well, kind of a solution approach, as you outlined um, at the very beginning. So is it just, um, I think it's SDG 12, um, correct me if I'm wrong, which is about responsible consumption uh, and production. Is that kind of the ultimate target of shaping a circular economy, or are there additional SDGs um, that a circular economy approach would help to achieve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. SDG number 12, responsible consumption and production, is uh, certainly the, the key, the core, let's say, um, and circular economy will help a lot to achieve that goal if we see it globally and holistically. But uh, circular economy will certainly address other SDGs as well, um, uh, depending on what, what exactly we look at as a topic, as a product, uh, as resources in there. Um, so it will have a very positive impact on life on land and life below water, depending on the resources, since we don't need many uh, primary resources uh, that we get from the mines, uh, etc. cetera. Um, uh, it will also have uh, a positive impact on uh, SDG number eight uh, decent work and economic growth obviously in a different way that uh, linear growth uh, was seen in the past but also on uh, on SDG number nine industry innovation and infrastructure innovation uh, will be a very good driver for circular economy or the other way around depending how you want to see that so uh, just to name a few uh, I would say circular economy will address many SDGs and it's uh, um, more or less up to your creativity to find the links um, and depending on the business model and uh, the uh, yeah respective products that you're looking at mm -hmm. I totally agree. Uh, I'm very fond of putting uh, the innovation industry and infrastructure would be, uh, from my heart, the, the core of the of the circular economy. Of course, addressing consumption and production, but also cities and city systems. Uh, so how we see sustainable cities uh, evolving on a circular principle, where we think of metabolisms and symbiosis, where everything comes in use. In a, it's very narrowed down to a geographical place. Uh, we have, of course, the, the, on, about collaboration, but this year uh, it was an uh, awakening point also learning from EU that this is the year of skills, understanding that circular economy is not only about material, I can see in the chat as well, it's a very much a mindset and human issue. So it's about social inclusion, not let human resources go to waste. This is a way to have new kind of uh, adoption for a workforce uh, so it's it, it has a multi-layer dimension on not only earth resources but also human as a resource and a part of the uh, inclusive economy okay well uh, then let me maybe add um, a final one before we already have to conclude i'm afraid um I guess there are people watching and listening to us from various industries today. So that's something I think, well, we should also be really clear about today. For whom are the takeaways from today's session going to be particularly relevant? Um, is it just the manufacturing companies? Um, what about, well, let's say insurers, banks, for example, what are the industry sectors that are affected by the circular transition of our economy. Any thoughts on this? Whoever the answer is simple. Uh, every industry. Uh, so there is no uh, kind of no industry out there uh, that is not affected by this topic. And uh, we had recent discussions with uh, some of our clients. Uh, they are retailers, and they said, "Okay." 
I, I can't influence circular economy. I mean, I'm not producing anything. We are just retailing. <laughs> Uh, okay, no, <laughs> that's not correct. So let's talk about your role in circular economy. Um, and that's very important. Uh, it's about education as well, um, to understand what the individual role in a circular economy ecosystem uh, is and will be. Um, and that requires yeah, education. It also requires some kind of uh, creativity, but also uh, yeah, transferring uh, your understanding after ha ha you had uh, some education on what uh, your business model requires as a change uh, with circular economy. Um, uh, so even retailers understand what their role in circular economy is, for example, um, uh, then they can influence a lot uh, by uh, yeah, uh, what products they buy and sell and uh, how they had been produced, uh, etc. So yeah, there's, uh, I, I would say, every market is involved. Catherine, what do you think? Oh, indeed. I, I have a hunch for transport logistics. I love that part. It's pretty invisible, but they will have huge impact. But I also go into accounting, accounting systems and monitoring report. So these will be like the systems approaches that I think will provide a huge transitional power. Mm. And maybe one last thought on that too. Um, no matter where you sit, right? Um, as we've highlighted, the hard part of this is it's about change and change is hard and change can be fearful, but it's opportunity. It's opportunity for business. It's opportunity to do good, to have a healthier world, to add more value as organizations and individuals. So it's also the lens through which we look at, look at it. Well, I'm afraid we are running out of time today. Um, so um, any uh, particular message that uh, you would like to leave with us? Uh, well, to, that you'd like people to take away from, from this session today? Final thoughts? I just want to learn if anybody has tried this, or I'm sure this is not a brave new thinking. Somebody's doing this already. So just having learning from somebody who is really connecting these uh, mindsets and uh, putting practices to live alive, I would love to learn more. And I'll say, um, let's seek out each other. We, uh, we have common passion, we have common goals and um, bringing together, I think, thought processes of business architecture and the blueprints. And most importantly, what we're trying to achieve with circular economy as professionals, let's, let's come together on that. Yeah, and you, you need a good strategy and the right tool set, as I mentioned before, and that's uh, kind of the the keys uh, that you need in your hands while thinking about how that affects you. Uh, so uh, think strategically and use the right tools like business architecture and others. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, actually, we we might need another session on this topic. Um, that's maybe yeah. something worth discussing um, uh, after this session, um, since there's so much more we could uh, talk about. Um, well, I can only say um, to all of you, Wendy, Catherine, Daniel, it was a great session. Um, really enjoyed the discussion with you today. Um, thanks a lot for this. Um, thanks a lot for, uh, for, for everyone to, for, for joining us today. And well, I hope to see you again next time. Yeah, Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.